You know, little children have a problem keeping secrets. Any of you parents ever notice that? Uh, I can remember my own experience as a child out on the playground, uh, secrets being passed around, and certain groups of uh, kids were privy to that information and others weren't, that kind of early form of gossip. But those secrets always seem to come out at some point. And Jill and I experience this a lot with our own kids. They just have the inability to keep secrets. In fact, we did a little experiment last night for Angel's uh, birthday dinner date with Daddy, uh, where I took her out to Steak and Shake, and uh, Jill was, was in on this, and I said, see how long it takes for her to come home and tell you where we went. And I said, Angel, do not tell Mommy where we went and what we did. She lasted about three minutes and, and told Mommy where, and that happens with, with all my kids when they have uh, <coughs> secrets that they're not supposed to tell. It's just part of their innocence. It's part of who they are. They're truth tellers. And when they have a truth, they want to share that truth, even when it gets parents in trouble sometimes. Uh, for instance, for some of y'all that have not been sanctified your whole life, I don't know if you've ever been to the all-you-can-eat restaurant standing in the line and the, the, the cashier says, how old is, is that child? You say, oh, she, she's three. And then the child says, no, Daddy, I'm four. Anybody know what I'm not? Or, or whenever maybe you've been saying some things about Miss So-and-so or passing that gossip around about Miss So-and-so and then here comes Miss So-and-so into the room and your child says, Hey, Mommy, there's Miss So-and-so, the one you said you know what about. Anybody ever go there? Kids just tell the truth. It's part of their nature. It's part of who they are. But unfortunately, as we grow, we develop, and we go through the process of adolescence and into adulthood, we learn to keep secrets, don't we? We have secrets that we want to stuff deep inside our soul. All of us have pain or harm or experiences that we've had or harm or sin that we've done to others. And we take those secrets and we stuff them inside the tomb of our hearts. We push them deep in there and say, I don't want to feel that anymore. I don't want to think about that anymore. I don't want to go there. But the truth is that secrets keep us sick. Those pain and those harms and those sins that we try to stuff into the tomb of our soul and seal away impede our spiritual growth. They're toxic and they keep us sick. But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ comes into our life and says repent and believe the good news. And part of that process of repentance is coming to the truth of who we are. It's looking at that stinky stuff. We all have stinky stuff. We all have pain and, and harm and things that we don't want the world to see. Can I get an amen? amen. But Jesus cousin comes into our life and says, roll away that stone and let's deal with that stinky stuff. The pain and the secrets and the things that have kept you in chains of bondage. The good news is, folks, that God loves you. He loves you and He wants you, all of you, in spite of you. The good, the bad, the ugly, even the stinky stuff. Let us pray. Lord God, we just thank you for your word. How many of y'all have got your Bibles here today? You got your Bibles? Grab hold of your Bible with me. Let's try something new. If you don't have a Bible, grab the Bible of the person next to you. Let's all have a Bible in our hands. Let's hold on to the word. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you for your word, which is a light unto our path. Uh, we thank you that it's a mirror that shows us who we are, uh, that we can be transformed by this word, that it's not simply a book, but it's a revelation about you, our Father, our Creator, our Sustainer. And so, Lord, we pray that this would not just be a time to listen to a good uh, speech, but that we would dig into your word, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of the word. So, Father, we pray we could lay aside all the burdens of our lives and the things that might uh, make our thoughts uh, trail uh, from focusing on this word. And we pray that this would not just be simply text on a page, but that you would cause these words to come forth and to live incarnate in us. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite Christian authors is a guy named Henry Nouwen. Anybody ever read any Nouwen? He's a, he's a great uh, spiritual writer. Uh, and one of his best books, in my opinion, is, is a book called The Wounded Healer. 
And in that book, Malin talks about uh, the fact that the great mistake of Christian leadership is to think that we can lead people out of a desert that we've never been to. In order to lead somebody out of a desert, you got to know the desert. you got to know the way out of the desert. you got to have the map to get out of the desert. Can I get an amen? <laughs> now it says, as ministers, and everybody here this morning is a minister of the gospel. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Every one of you is a priesthood of all believers uh, that have, God has a calling on your life. And he says, the starting point of our service to others, our ministry as ministers, is to come to the realization of our deepest wounds, our deepest need, the, 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 the place where we come to a poverty of spirit, and make that the starting point of our spiritual service to others. We all have wounds. We all have scars. We all have a pain that we've experienced and pain that we've inflicted upon others. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sins and we all have mistakes that we've made. And now it says that through yielding those wounds to God, we're caught up in this transformative healing process. Uh, wounds that are, are not treated or dealt with uh, can stink, they can fester, and ultimately they can kill. I know my wife and I spend a lot of time treating wounds. Uh, scraped knees, broken bones, uh, falls to the head, chipped teeth. All the time we're, we're dealing with the wounds of our children and doing our best to treat those wounds with some peroxide or a thermometer or some neosporin. And our God, our Heavenly Father, when we bring those wounds to Him, He treats those wounds. Christ heals our wounds. So not only does He heal them, but He transforms them in a way that they become a tool in His hands. The amazing thing about our God is that He can take our worst liabilities, our worst mistakes, and He can transform them into our greatest assets. He can take those things that, that we've been stuffing inside our souls all our lives, and when we bring them to Him, He can heal them in such a way that wounds become sacred wounds. And the scars that we have tell a story. They become a testimony in the hand of God into the lives of others. And so we become wounded healers who bring that healing into the lives of others who have sin and who have wounds in their life. And that's the situation that we found ourselves in several weeks ago when we launched out on this journey uh, uh, of resurrection. Now, there's a guy named Lazarus who's sick. He's wounded. He's sick to death. We talked about the fact that sometimes churches can be sick because churches are made up of human beings. Can I get an amen? amen. We looked up at the screen. We looked at some statistics that say that our church has probably been sick for quite some time. But Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, they have a great instinct. They call immediately for Jesus. When Lazarus presents with these symptoms, they say, somebody go get Jesus. Jesus gets word that Lazarus is sick, but he waits back where he is for a couple days. And in the process, Lazarus dies. Jesus says that this illness is going to lead to my glorification. And we talked about the fact that for Jesus, glorification was obedience to the will of the Father. Uh, fulfilling that mission. Mission was the heartbeat of his ministry. And in face of whatever consequences to his own life, he was going to fulfill. That was glorification for Jesus. We saw the disciples say, Lord, we don't want to go down to Judea and heal Lazarus. Last time you were down there, they tried to stone you to death. And so the disciples are operating in fear. Jesus is operating in faith. We talked about how sometimes as a church we can be walking and operating in fear instead of faith in who Jesus Christ is. But ultimately the, the disciples come to the decision that we're going to go down. We're willing to die. Whatever happens to Jesus uh, is going to happen to us. And they make that journey down to Bethany. And Jesus comes into a situation that is beyond repair. He is four days late and a dollar short. Even the Pharisees who believe in the resurrection know that the soul irreparably departs from the body after three days. But here comes Jesus into town. And Martha hears that Jesus is in town. And she runs out to where Jesus is and says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that you can do something about this. You can ask of the Father and he'll give it to you. And so Jesus uh, says to her, your brother's going to rise again, Martha. And Martha says, yes, Lord, I know one day, by and by, in that future event, Lazarus will be raised from the dead. But then Jesus says some words to her that causes her to reframe her understanding of God, life, death, and everything she ever knew. When he says to her, I am, I am that I am, connecting himself to divinity, the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they'll live again. And those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? 
And Martha makes that connection. She's called to the heart of what she believes about Jesus Christ. The resurrection and eternal life is not just some significant event in the future. The resurrection and eternal life is a person and his name is Jesus Christ. And we can walk in that resurrection power. We can walk in that eternal life right here, right now, through our relationship with him and through belief in who he is. Can I get an amen? amen. And so Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe you're that one. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. The one who fulfills all all of the expectations of the Jews, the one who is divine equality with God, uh, and the one who's bringing that kingdom here into the world right now. And so Martha goes and gets Mary, her sister, brings her sister out to, to Jesus. Jesus waits back to allow that memorialization process to happen. They are grieving the, the death of Lazarus. There are Jews from the surrounding area who've come to console the sisters, and they see Mary get up and go to Jesus. They think they're going to a tomb, but they end up at Jesus. So the, the Jews, Mary, Martha come to Jesus, and last week we saw Mary laid out at the feet of Jesus crying. We saw the Jews weeping and crying, and Jesus begins to weep. And we talked about the fact that Jesus weeping is not necessarily an emphasis on his humanity, that a weeping Jesus is a revelation about his divinity. That it's not a, a weeping Jesus is not about how human Jesus is, it's about how much love God is. Can I get an amen? amen? That God loves us so much that He suffers with us. That He's vulnerable with us. That He doesn't just have uh, sympathy towards our situation, but He has empathy. He walks with us through our pains and the wounds of our life. He cries when we cry. and He feels this aching love for us. In spite of our mistakes, in spite of uh, all the ways we've turned against Him, He loves us. And so Jesus allows that process of mourning to happen for a little while. And then He says, take me to the tomb, which is where we pick up this morning in the 38th verse. Uh, from the Word of God, the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter, the 38th verse. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. Jesus is greatly disturbed. He's went through the whole range of emotions of, of anger, uh, of, of love, of, of weeping, of pain. He says, take me to the tomb. See, there's a time for tears, and there's a time for memorialization, and there's a time for remembering. There's healing in tears. But then there's a time when we've got to move on. Can I get an amen? They were weeping, they were crying, they were mourning the loss of Lazarus, but sometimes we can get so caught up in that cycle of, of pain and grief and crying, but Jesus says we've dwelt in the problem long enough, let's get to the solution. And Jesus is the solution. Amen. He can do something about what's happening in that too. There's a time to cry, there's a time to look back at our past and to realize who we are, to shape our future and our present. There's a time to cry, but there's a time to move on. Jesus says, take me down to the tomb. We've dwelt in the problem long enough. Let's get to the solution. And he comes to the tomb. The thing that they are scared the most of dealing with, that tomb, where the body of Lazarus is. See, we have this proclivity as human beings when something dies or something's painful or something we don't want to deal with. We want to take that thing, we want to stick it somewhere, we want to seal it up and not deal with it anymore. Well, we don't want to think about it. We don't want to experience it in our hearts and our minds again. And so we have a tomb that we stick those things, we roll it away, the stone in front of it, we seal it off, we don't want to think about it. But Jesus calls us to go down to the tomb. It was a cave that had a stone lying against it. Now, the Jewish uh, folks had a little bit different burial process than we do today. They did not cremate and they did not uh, embalm people. Uh, but what they did was they would take the body of the loved one, they would wrap it in a, a pure, clean linen. They would take that body, they would scent it with uh, perfume and different kinds of myrrh. There would be a funeral procession out to the tomb. Usually outside of every village and town and city, there'd be a community tomb place, uh, kind of like what our, our graveyard today. They'd place that body in the tomb, they'd put a stone in front of it, they'd seal it so the process of decomposition could take place. And after an appointed period of time, they would come back, they'd roll that stone away. What would be left would just be the bones of the loved one. They would take those bones, they would put them in an ossuary or a bone box, 
and they would store the bones of the relatives all together uh, to await that resurrection day. So that's what's happened with Lazarus. They've taken that body, they've stuck it in that tomb four days ago. For four days, that body's been in there decomposing, rotting away, going through the process that bodies go through uh, uh, in that tomb. And Jesus comes to the, the face of that tomb and he says, take away the stone. Now, at this point, even the disciples who are standing there got to be scratching their heads and biting their fingernails, right? This is not just a, a Mary Martha thing. This is a very public thing. The Jews are gathered there. The same Jews who just a couple verses later are going to be the ones that demand the death of Jesus. The same Jews, some of them are going to come to faith. They're there. Mary's there. Martha's there. The disciples are there. Jesus goes to the tomb and says, roll away the stone. Now notice that Jesus doesn't roll the stone away himself. He asks us to roll away the stone. See, God doesn't do for us what we can do for ourselves. He says, you roll away the stone, I'll do the miracle. Can I get an amen? amen. God's given us hands and a heart and emotion and ability. He's created us in his own image. There are things that we can do and we play a part in the miraculous nature of Jesus Christ. He says, you roll away that stone, I'll deal with what's inside. But everybody standing there is thinking, why in the world this body's been in there for four days decomposing? Why would anybody want to roll that stone away? There are things in there that, that we don't want to see or experience. But Jesus says, take away the stone. Now, he's God. He could have moved the stone himself. He could have called an angel to move the stone. But he asked them to participate in the miracle. You move the stone, I'll do the miracle. And Martha... The sister of the dead man. Notice that the text wants us to understand that there is a dead man in this tomb. This is not about Jesus just uh, creating an all new Lazarus. This is about Jesus resurrecting the Lazarus that's already there. The Lazarus that everybody's known and loved. He's going to take that dead body and that Lazarus and he's going to cause new life to come into it and resurrect it from the dead. The sister of the dead man, Martha says, Lord, already there's a stench. Because he's been in dead in there for four days. Lord, you don't want to roll that stone away. There's some stinky stuff in there. Lord, that body's been in there decomposing for four days, doing the things that bodies do when they've been dead for four days. You don't want to roll that stone away. Now, this is the same Martha that just verses before comes out to Jesus and says, Jesus, yes, I believe you're the resurrection and the life. Yes, I believe you're the one, the Messiah and the Son of God. She says the words with her mouth. She intellectually assents to who Jesus is, but she doesn't believe who Jesus is in her heart. There's a disconnect between what she thinks in her head and what she feels in her heart. See, sometimes the longest journey that we can make in this life is to get what's in our head into our hearts. She says, one minute, yes, Lord, I believe you're the resurrection and the life. And yes, I believe you can resurrect my brother from the dead. But then in the next minute, she's saying, don't roll that stone away. There's a dead body in there. It's been in there four days. And you don't want to deal with the stinky stuff that's in that tomb. And folks, as a church, we can get in that place where we confess with our mouth one thing and believe in our heart something else. Amen. I know y'all don't say amen. amen. We can come to church every Sunday. We can sing the songs. We can say the prayers. We can tip God, put a tip in the bucket. We can read the Apostles' Creed and say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, was resurrected. We can say the words, but not believe in our hearts and who Jesus is. And so our faith can debilitate the miraculous nature of Christ and what he wants to do in our faith. Can I get an amen? amen? She says one thing, but her faith is not at the place where it needs to be. She's so focused on the corpse that she can't see the Christ. Standing between Martha in the resurrection of her brother is a stone. And her fear of what's on the other side of that stone is so great, so paralyzing, that she asks the Lord not to roll it away. And folks, we can get to that place in our faith where we say the words, 
but we've lost our belief. We say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't necessarily believe He can heal the sick. We say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't necessarily believe He can cure blindness. Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't necessarily believe that He can resurrect the dead. And we encounter a Jesus in Holy Scripture that says, I am the resurrection and the life. I can heal the sick. I can cast out blindness. I can resurrect the dead. But if we don't have a faith to believe in His resurrection power, if we're too scared to roll the stone away, then we can never experience the resurrection that's waiting on the other side. We've got a part to play in the miracle. Roll the stone away. There's some stinky stuff behind that stone that Martha does not want to deal with. And folks, in our spiritual lives, personally, in our journeys, we can have stinky stuff in the tomb of our hearts that keep us bound up and trapped and chained. We can have things we don't want to deal with, situations of, of anger and hurt. We can withhold forgiveness. We can have pain that we seal up in our hearts. And when we seal it up, we, we hope that it will go away, but it continues to keep us sick. But Jesus says, let's roll the stone away. Let's get to the solution. Let's deal with the problems so that we can have a resurrection. And as a congregation, folks, we've got some things that we've stuffed in the tomb. As a congregation, we've been through some battles. We've been through some pain. We've been through some loss. There's been people whose feelings have been hurt. There's people who've left the church. There's people who've uh, set up allegiances. And there's been backbiting and fighting. And there's been hypocrisy. And there's been uh, uh, gossip. And we are human beings. We don't like conflict. And so what do we do? We take those things. We stuff them in the tomb. We roll the stone and say, I don't want to deal with those things. But Christ calls us to roll that stone away, to face who we are, to face those situations, so that He can resurrect them. So that His healing power can be let loose. But if we're not willing to roll the stone away, we'll never see the resurrection on the other side. Maybe there's some of you here this morning that you've been holding on, holding back your forgiveness. Maybe there's some of you here this morning who you've wounded others and maybe you need to make amends. Maybe there's relationships that have been damaged in this church. There's been words that have been said or not said that are causing hostility and pain in relationships. But Christ calls us to speak the truth in love. Christ calls us not to, to hide those things, but to deal with them and allow His transforming power to work in them. Here's the amazing thing about our Lord. He can take our worst pain, our worst suffering, our conflicts, the stinky stuff of our life, our worst liabilities, and He can transform them into our greatest assets. They become tools in His hands to lead others to the kingdom. You see, scars tell a story. And when we're willing to yield those wounds, they can become sacred wounds that bring people into relationship with Him. He says to Martha, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Martha, where is your faith? Didn't I tell you that if you just believed, your brother would be resurrected from the dead? When we become willing to deal with the stinky stuff, when we become willing to roll that stone away and allow Christ into the deepest areas of our life and to bring restoration and healing in our personal lives and our congregation, then a resurrection is waiting just on the other side of that. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. But we've got to have the willingness to roll that stone away and deal with the stinky stuff. So I've asked you this morning to put on those index cards, what are the wounds of our past as a congregation that are keeping us sick in our present? What are the unresolved conflicts that we've hid away in the tomb of our hearts? What are the situations that we've been hiding from that need to be dealt with in order for us to experience healing and resurrection? What are the things that we need to come together, speak the truth in love, and let go of? You see, because when they roll that stone away, Christ is going to turn their greatest fears and their greatest pain into something beautiful. New life and resurrection. We all have stinky stuff. 
I've dealt with a lot of stinky stuff in my life, and I've shared with you before uh, that I was born to addicted to a mother who abandoned me at birth, and I have a biological father that is known. And not that my mom was an evil person, or she was a sick person that never got help. And I was raised by my grandparents, who also had some issues. But I can remember when I was six years old, my mother began to send me these postcards, and these letters, and these pictures of these beautiful snow-covered mountains in Elmira, New York. And she sent me these letters about how I'm sorry, and I love you, and I'm on the wagon for keeps, and I want you in my life. And as a little boy, I wanted to know who my mom was. And so I got on a plane, and I went up to Elmira, New York to, to meet my mother and to live with her. And it was the worst pain and hell of my entire life. There was a man there that abused me sexually, physically, emotionally. I was abused by my mom. I experienced and saw things that no child should see. And I remember in that place, there was these snow-covered mountains all around us, and there were these planes that used to take off, off one of those mountains. And I remember thinking as a kid, if I could just get to those planes, I could get back down safe to Florida. And I made a couple attempts at that. And ultimately, I was taken into custody and ended up back in Florida. To make a long story short, I had, years later, I had the opportunity to go back to that place in New York. And I didn't want to go. I didn't want to deal with those past memories and that hurt and the things that I experienced there. I didn't want to face that stinky stuff. But I went there and I went to that very airport that I used to see as a little kid watching those planes take off and it was a sailplane museum. And I got into a sailplane, which is a plane that's pulled up by a cable and, and they release you and just kind of soar on the wind, no engine. And just me and a pilot went up in that sailplane. And I remember looking down on that place where my stinky stuff was where all the pain and the heartache and, and the worst memories of my childhood were. And I remember just feeling this sense of peace. And I laughed and I cried. And I realized I had this spiritual moment that there I was soaring high above all that pain and all that darkness. And I realized that God had lifted me and redeemed me from all that and that that didn't have to keep me trapped in anger and hatred and fear but that I could be free. And folks, when we learn to face our stinky stuff, when we learn to, to deal with that pain that we've been trapping away in our hearts, then we'll experience a freedom and a newness of life like we could never believe. God wants you, all of you, the good, the bad, and even the still <coughs> stuff. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your word. And Lord, as we prepare to come to your table, I know that there are many people here this morning who have things that have kept us trapped and bound. Lord, as a congregation, we've experienced quarrels and fights and feuds, and perhaps we've not dealt with those things. Perhaps we've been afraid to roll that stone away and deal with what's inside. But we remember the promise of your word, which tells us that you're a God of resurrection. And that if we're just willing to do our part and make those amends and offer forgiveness, that you'll do amazing and profound things. And so as we come to your table, which is the highlight of this service, to come to you, Lord, and to experience your real presence and to be obedient to your word, to do this always in remembrance and to receive your grace afresh. <coughs> if there's any thing in our hearts that needs to be left at the altar today, God, we pray that you would give us the courage to do that, that we would leave it like a stain on the floor and go forth in the newness of life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.